Today on Investigate TV Plus, for many, a visit to a loved one's final resting place is an important part of keeping their memory alive. I'm Tisha Powell. And I'm Lee Zurich, but our investigation reveals African American burial sites across the country face abandonment, even desecration. We're being devalued as a family. Um, we're being devalued as a race. You know, we're saying that, well, you're not important. Your grave site's not important. Your history is not important. Plus, what one expert says it will take to preserve sites across the country. And ransomware attacks allowing hackers to get their hands on your personal information. So it's not a problem that's going away. And in some cases, as our technologies have developed, it's gotten worse. Yay. How you can protect yourself from this cyber crime. Then restaurant redemption. We make everything from scratch. This woman's journey from having almost nothing. $10 left in my name the day we, we opened up the business. So it was a real risk. To serving up some of the best spuds in town with the side of second chances. In-depth stories that inform and inspire. You're watching Investigate TV Plus. For centuries, experts say African-American cemeteries have been neglected, mismanaged, or lost entirely due to social injustices and the inequitable treatment of black Americans. The Black Cemetery Network works to identify burial grounds. So far, it's registered more than 130 black cemeteries across the eastern half of the U.S., but it believes there are many more sites with this sacred history. The loved ones of long lost ancestors are now joining the fight to preserve their family's legacy. Investigative reporter Carice Jackman explores the complex issue of protecting sacred ground. When you walk into the Oak Run Baptist Church in Thoroughfare, Virginia, it's like going back in time. Our church was established in 1865. It was originally called Little Zion Church. African American history visible throughout the sanctuary Frank Washington's indigenous and African roots both run through this town. My family's connection with this town is probably deeper than most people in this area because we go back generations and we can prove our generational uh, attachment to the county itself. Part of his generational attachment lies here at the Fletcher Allen Cemetery. Some of them have their headstones marked. Others are marked by just stones, a common practice when enslaved Africans buried their family members. Names not written but clear signs their lives existed. These are usually the only identifying markers you would have for graves in, you know, from that time frame. It's either something like this or a smaller stone like that. Not far down the road, Washington says another group of his ancestors lay buried. The Scott Cemetery, which is on the other side of here, has 75 to 100. But the final resting place of these ancestors is no longer in his reach. We have a, a lack of respect for for those that have gone before us. Um, we have one cemetery that has been completely bulldozed. Washington says the Scott Cemetery now sits beneath land owned by a brewery. It's a cemetery that is documented. It's not some obscure uh, thing that came about out of the blue. It's something that is established within the county records itself. Washington's now in a legal battle with the brewery and the county's board of supervisors, but the brewery isn't backing down. The owner responded to our request for comments, saying in a statement that Washington's allegations are completely without merit and says the, quote, speculative grave site underwent two extensive archaeological studies by professional firms, adding that Mr. Washington just can't accept the science, which revealed no presence of burial remains. Washington, who grew up in thoroughfare his entire life, continues to argue the graves are documented, as illustrated in this historic research. We're being devalued as a family. Um, we're being devalued as a race. You know, we're saying that, well, you're not important. Your grave site's not important. Your history is not important. And our national investigative team found it's not a singular case. We found dozens of other cases where African Americans are consistently fighting to protect the land of their loved ones from construction and development. The complicated web of tracking black cemeteries is as complex as American history itself. Following the end of slavery, many African-American families continue to face restrictions on where they can bury their ancestors. Across much of the U.S., local law segregated burial sites by race. 
African-American burial grounds often fail to receive the same type of maintenance and record keeping that predominantly white burial grounds enjoyed. Fast forward over a century later and the country's dark past makes discovering black burial sites a challenge state and local governments face to this day. Every state in the country has cemetery laws, but they differ from place to place. When we were looking for how many black cemeteries are there, you know, are they protected? We found it very difficult to find out if state departments know how many cemeteries there are, if the cemetery laws are being enforced, how many permits were actually filed, if there were any at all. Is that the daunting task that you guys have found as well when it comes to actually making sure that these sites are preserved? You can't preserve something unless you know where it is and what it is in most cases. When it comes to protecting those who have gone before us, um, it's important for us to understand um, where those are so that we can understand uh, how to protect them. Sarah Bronin also believes funding for sites and burial grounds is a necessity that is long overdue. Federal agencies have not been blameless in uh, the treatment of burial sites. This is my great Aunt Betty, and she used to sit right here in this, this pew every Sunday. As for Frank, he refuses to give up his fight. He says he won't rest until his community recognizes his family. Regardless of what they've done, it's not going to change my belief in myself. It's not going to change the fact that I value who I am. It's not going to change the fact that I value those bodies lying in that grave. Whether I know their last names or not, um, I know they existed. I'm proof that they existed. In December 2022, President Biden signed the African American Burial Grounds Preservation Act into law. It established a program at the National Park Service to provide grants and technical assistance to research, identify, and preserve these cemeteries. But we looked at the fiscal budget for 2023 funding and found zero dollars allocated. The National Park Service says Congress has the authority to appropriate funding for operating the grant program. President Biden's budget request for 2024 does include $3 million for this program. We want to hear from you. Are you having a similar fight? Our investigative team is conducting a survey. To submit your story, please visit investigatetv.com and look for Sacred Ground. Still ahead on Investigate TV Plus, looking to change your nine to five? We'll show you how to be your own investigator to help you land your next dream job. Plus, cyber criminals getting more savvy. Account numbers, conditions, diagnosis, dates of service, images, treatments, etc. That's everything on me. How hundreds of thousands of Medicare recipients ended up with their personal information in the hands of hackers. It's causing me to have a lot of nervousness, uh, panic attacks. Um, hard to sleep at night, you know, because I'm constantly thinking about this. You can watch Investigate TV Plus anytime streaming online. Get the app for Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. They're free to download. According to the federal government, in May of 2023, the personal information of more than 600,000 Medicare recipients was stolen in a ransomware attack. We're talking social security numbers, addresses, and medical histories, all at the fingertips of cyber criminals. While the aftermath of this kind of data breach isn't yet fully understood, as reporter Lauren Traeger shows us, some victims have already lost their peace of mind. Very angry, very frustrated. You know, it makes you just lose faith in the system. Andre Wright says he couldn't believe the letter he received a few weeks ago. I was freaked out. I was like, what is this? And I read it carefully and then I read it again. There had been a security vulnerability, it said. And as a Medicare recipient, Andre's personal information had been compromised. All of it. My social security number, driver's license number, Medicare beneficiary medical history, include medical records, account numbers, conditions, diagnosis, dates of service, images, treatments, etc. That's everything on me. Just the sheer volume, he says, is shocking. They said they even have images of me. 
I'm like, wow, really? How did, how did that happen? The letter says he can get free credit monitoring. The fix that they're offering, is it working for you? No, no. But he says he's been unable to sign up. No one answers the phone. I mean, I stay on the phone for like an hour. The phone's just ringing. Nobody would never answer. Left in knots. It's causing me to have a lot of nervousness, uh, panic attacks. Um, hard to sleep at night, you know, because I'm constantly thinking about this. Plus the fact it was the contractors of the federal government that allowed it to happen. That's on them. That's not my fault. I should not have to go through something like this and worry every day what could happen or what may happen or what's going to happen. When I first heard about this, I thought this is really bad. Scott Graneman is a cybersecurity expert and professor at Webster because, University. I mean, this is a criminal's dream to have that information, not just for identity theft, but for extortion of individuals as well. And it's already known who did it. The ransomware gang known as CLOP. And it wasn't just the federal government impacted in this same attack on a software called Move It. It's used to transfer sensitive data over the internet. By hacking that software, the CLOP gang compromised the data of 600 organizations globally with Reuters estimating an impact to 40 million people. Pretty much any sort of personal identification information that you would not want anyone else to have is now owned by CLOP, the ransomware gang. It's bad stuff. But he says it's that the federal government has outsourced so many things. That's why Medicare got hit. That's the problem. We're so interconnected with everything and we farmed it out with so many different organizations that it becomes a problem. Freezing your credit could help protect you, but otherwise... If your data is stored somewhere and there's a vulnerability and the bad guys have been able to siphon all of it out, there's not much you can do. And ransomware attacks like these, he says, are only going to get bigger. So it's not a problem that's going away. And in some cases, as our technologies have developed, it's gotten worse. Yay! And it's not fair. It's all so frightening for Andre, now left wondering what will happen next. Even while we're sleeping, they're hacking. And that's dangerous. We were able to help Andre get in touch with that company who will now monitor his credit. After the data breach, Progress Software said it partnered with cybersecurity companies and identified its vulnerabilities. In June of 2023, it rolled out an update to its software. In St. Louis, I'm Lauren Traeger. There's not a lot you can do once hackers have your personal information, but you can do your part to protect yourself and your office from data breaches like this one. Some tips from the federal government. Keep your computer updated. Use caution with links and attachments and emails. And before opening and responding, verify it's from a legitimate sender. Still ahead, meet the group giving people the tools. It's part of being self-sufficient, it's part of the structure. For a successful life after prison. The messages change uh, from week to week. You're going to have to live with the decisions you make. Plus, the most in-demand jobs over the next 10 years. Does your dream career make the list? Find out next and how you can be your own investigator to get the most money at the negotiating table. Our in-depth coverage continues. You can get connected to Investigate TV Plus on all social media platforms. According to Bankrate's 2023 Job Seeker Survey, 56% of workers are likely to look for another job over the next year. Around one in five job seekers reported a flexible working arrangement like working from home as a motivator for wanting a new job. If you're thinking about a career change, you'll want to know how to negotiate pay and perks. Reporter Josie Sturman shows us how you can be your own investigator to land your dream job. Considering a new job or a career change, you don't have to go in blind. In this Be Your Own Investigator, we've got some ideas you can use to polish up that resume and start searching. When you're job searching, one of your first thoughts is probably, show me the money. Well, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics can give you an idea of what a new job or career could pay. Head over to bls.gov, then click on subjects and start clicking through the pay and benefits tab. Check out wages by occupation and area. 
For example, we can see the average pay for a retail salesperson in Erie, Pennsylvania is around $21 per hour. If you're thinking of switching up your 9 to 5, one great thing to consider is where the most demand exists. So what are the hot jobs right now? The BLS has that too. Go to Publications and click on the Occupational Outlook Handbook. You can see what's likely to be in demand and what those jobs typically pay. Check this out. For the next 10 years, these are the occupations with the most projected openings. Home health and personal care aides, software developers, restaurant cooks, stockers and order fillers, and registered nurses. In fact, the bulk of the federal government predictions are in healthcare, tech, finance, and truck driving, construction, and freight-related fields. But money isn't everything, and you probably want to know if other people like working at the company. Your first stop might be to Google employer reviews. You'll find a lot of resources where current and past employees leave their hot takes on what's really happening behind the scenes. Glassdoor and Indeed are a couple of popular sites, but keep in mind people are often more likely to leave a review when they're upset and had a bad experience rather than a good one. So in addition to your online research, see if you can link up with a real person who currently works there to get some intel on the situation. With this Be Your Own Investigator, I'm Josie Sturman. Still ahead, a recipe for success. I know a lot of love going to the food. How this woman went from prison to running a popular potato restaurant. And I just tried to become a, uh, the woman that I was meant to be. So when I got home, I just hit the ground running. And how she's inspiring others to take control of their own future. I'm Viv Williams with a medical Mythbuster moment. Myth, pickleball is low impact, so you don't have to worry about getting hurt on the court, right? Well, wrong. Medical providers are seeing broken bones, sprains, and overuse injuries from playing the sport. Harris Pohl did a survey for Orlando Health and found that roughly one-third of people who get a sports injury on the pickleball court or on any playing field don't seek medical help. Why not? Because they think it will heal on its own. But experts say you should get injuries evaluated because they could get worse or become chronic without proper treatment. With this medical mythbuster, I'm Viv Williams. You can watch Investigate TV Plus anytime online. Just subscribe to our YouTube channel at Investigate TV. You can catch stories and full episodes. According to the Department of Justice, in 2021, there were more than 1.2 million people in U.S. prisons. And when they get out, a DOJ study shows people who were incarcerated are likely to reoffend. Stopping this cycle is what inspired a Michigan restaurant owner to team up with a local nonprofit. Reporter David Custer shows us her very own story of redemption and revival. We make everything from scratch, add our own ingredients. I know a lot of love going to the food. A lot of love from a woman who says she once didn't love herself. I just wanted to be a different person because I knew I had been a decay on my community at one point. So I wanted to be a different woman when I came home. A homecoming that was far from a celebration. Kisa Smith became the successful business owner of Spectacular Spuds out of necessity. I was uh, indicted, federal, federal indicted back in uh, 2006. Um, I sold marijuana for a long time, uh, right here in the Flint, and um, I was given, we were arrested, after we were indicted, I was given a four and a half year, well actually they gave me six and a half year sentence. She didn't serve the entire sentence, let out early because she became a model prisoner. She took classes, mentored inmates, believing this was her moment to turn her life around. And I just tried to become a, uh, the woman that I was meant to be. So when I got home, I just hit the ground running. Once out, Smith said she couldn't even get an entry-level job because once an employer learned about her felony conviction, her employment was denied. So she started her own catering business with the help of many and just pennies in her pocket. $10 left in my name the day we, we opened up the business, so it was a real risk. The odds were against her. In fact, more than 40% released from prison will be back within a year. And because of this, a mid-Michigan man who was on the other side is making it his life mission to give all ex-offenders a fighting chance. 
We wanted to create this inviting atmosphere of learning and really giving an individual an opportunity to focus and if they're serious and getting their lives um, back on the right path. Leon Al Alamin founded the MADE Institute, an organization that creates an environment where returning citizens are provided housing, education, job training, and the motivation to make a difference. And then the messages change uh, from week to week. You're going to have to live with the decisions you make. There really wasn't too many programs that particularly addressed this population. Each room is equipped with a refrigerator, bed, uh, clean bedding. At one time, it was like 700 people coming back to Flint and Genesee County from prison and jail, state and federal prison, um, or on the low end, maybe around about 500 each year. That's a lot of people. Rules and regulations uh, uh, stipulate that they keep it clean at all times. Clean up behind themselves. It's part of being self-sufficient. It's part of the structure. It's part of order. But 2018, the current, we even reached about 300 people. 80, 80, 85 percent are still doing well. The recidivism rate, haven't you know committed any crimes, things like that. And Kisa believes if she can cook up an ounce of inspiration for someone craving a second chance, then she's doubling down on sharing the trials and tribulations that led to her own recipe for success. It doesn't. It doesn't matter where you are. You have to um, just find that drive and keep going. But dreams definitely have no expiration date. You know, it's so important that people be given a second chance. And she was so motivated to start up that restaurant. And look how it's paid off. And the program is great. And mm -hmm. look, they've had a lot of success. And everybody does need a second chance, for yeah. sure. All right, that's it for us on Investigate TV Plus. I'm Lee Zurich. And I'm T. Chappelle. Thanks for watching. Next time on Investigate TV Plus, reports of electric vehicles catching fire, sparking frustration. It's terrible. I've spent thousands of dollars on that car and now I can barely even drive it and it's just heartbreaking. The repair backlogs forcing families to pay the price.